Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for inviting me. I hope you'll enjoy this, because uh, these TEDx talks are really important, because basically this is a way in which we can start getting uh, new ideas, new concepts around, and, um, and make people think, because this is actually the age of innovation. We have terrible problems in, in Britain in doing innovation, because the place is so damn stable, so it's really bloody difficult. <laughs> And uh, I take my hat off to, st uh, to Steve Jobs because uh, that was just the greatest innovation of all. Um, we specialize, as you heard, in uh, very high technology engineering projects. We've done boats, we've done airplanes, uh, we've done cars, and probably the most famous ones are the, the land speed record cars. We've actually held the world land speed record now for um, a total of 30 years against all comers, so we're very proud of all that. Um, but the high spot of all this was breaking the sound barrier way back in 1997. So we've got a bit of footage here for you to have a look at. Amazing standing at the midpoint of the course, seeing this car come up faster than any aeroplane you've ever seen, and then a huge supersonic ba boom, double bang, could be heard 40 miles away, and in the little village of Gerlach, 15 miles away, it was shaking the school. Uh, that's proper motor racing, not this little round and round stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now, to get to there, to get to that position, we had to do some incredible innovation because fundamentally that project was impossible in Britain. Uh, it just wasn't possible. You've got to ask these large organizations, put up money. Uh, it's very, very difficult. And some of the things we achieved there, is, it's worth just looking at it. Um, the car was rear wheel steered, so we pioneered um, supersonic rear, rear wheel steering. We were the first to use computational fluid dynamics to work out the aerodynamics on the car, 10 years ahead of Formula One. Um, our website was really very interesting. It was the first in the UK to do end-to-end -end electronic trading. It was one of the very first blog websites, first to do crowdsourcing, and we had to fund all our fuel to get our airplane from, uh, from UK to uh, US. Uh, that was amazing. All over the world, people followed it, and uh, they uh, funded 30,000 gallons of jet fuel every day. It was fantastic. Um, and it was a big program. The interesting thing about it was we discovered the public love engineering on a brand scale. So we gave them on their website 800 pages of, 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 uh, of engineering. And the interesting thing about this was our website was the fifth largest in the world in 1997. So that's how it was done. The car thrust us to sea was driven by Andy Green. And it's on display in Coventry in the museum, where 400,000 people a year come to see it. It's probably the most famous car in the world. They've actually had to enlarge the museum. So if you go there today, they're sort of rebuilding it. Um, and in March this year, I'm very proud of the fact that the American Society of uh, Mechanical Engineers gave it engineering landmark status, which gave us the same status as the Saturn V rocket, the lunar module, and the space shuttle. Uh, there are only 250 of those in the world, so uh, I'm proud of that. Anyhow, we all swore that when we finished that project, we'd never ever do this again. <laughs> okay, and then of course what happened is a great American, Steve Fawcett, decided he was going to challenge for the land speed record. And Steve had got the money, he'd got the determination, the ability to do this, and he represented a real threat. So Andy Green and I met in a pub and said, what the hell are we going to do? And we said, uh, there were three options, do nothing, build our, um, uh, a car now, or basically wait and see what the Americans are going to do. So we decided we'd build a car now. But what we would do is build the ultimate, because this is going to be the last one. OK, and we're, we're set for Mach 1.4, 1,000 miles an hour. Uh, the car's 135,000 horsepower. It goes 0 to 1,000 miles an hour in 55 seconds. Uh, it goes 200 miles an hour faster than uh, the Eurofighter which gave our friends at Rolls-Royce a few problems. <laughs> and the wheels go round at 170 revolutions a second. OK. In design program, it's absolutely massive. It's taken 60 man years to do the design. 
Um, we've had to acquire a Eurofighter jet engine. We're very fortunate to have three of those now. We've had to design and develop a rocket engine. We went a long way down the line with that. Now we've teamed up with the Norwegians and uh, we're using their rocket, which is great. Um, we've got to, we'll talk about the education in a moment, but we've got to arrange for all the car data to be transferred from the car live at a thousand miles an hour from the middle of an African desert. Uh, we've got to set up a global science, technology, engineering, mathematics um, education program. And uh, we've got to do all this in parallel. And if one of those fails, uh, it'll fail the entire project. The story really came about because one man, uh, his name is Lord Drayson. He was the Minister for Defence Equipment and Support. Andy Green's idea was that we should go and have a meeting with Drayson and um, <clears throat> try and persuade him to give us a jet engine. OK, so we had this meeting. It went very well until I asked for the jet engine and then didn't go so well. <laughs> and we'd failed. So we got to get out of that meeting fast. We got out of that meeting fast. And um, as we went to the door, Drayson said, you can do something for us. And I said, yes, of course, Minister, what can we do for you? And he said, we have an enormous problem in Britain. We can't, cr we can't uh, recruit in the Ministry of Defence scientists and engineers. There aren't any. It's a nightmare. It's all gone wrong. And he went on to say that basically this, this was never a problem during the 1950s, 60s and 70s because Britain had a fantastic aerospace industry and all these kids were inspired by what was actually going on. Um, because the aeroplanes are flying all the time and kids were seeing them. So um, now today, of course, this doesn't happen. The aerospace industry is just in Britain is just making wings and engines and uh, you don't see the military fighters anymore. So, uh, um, you know, the inspiration has gone. And so it was Drayson's idea to run the project through all the schools uh, to, uh, to do this. We then started studying Britain and we found a terrible, terrible mess very similar to in the US, but basically uh, the engineer population has declined and in the engineering companies, uh, most of them are in their 40 to 60 year olds. So basically they're going to be retired soon. In the aircraft industry, they're going to lose 60% of their skilled workforce by 2020 through retirement. Huge problems in the schools. Um, key to becoming an engineer is the need for physics and mathematics. And uh, the kids don't like doing physics and mathematics. It's kind of difficult. Why? There's no real inspiration. Why? Because inspiration comes at the moment from, um, from the media and it's all singing, dancing, pastry and cooking. <laughs> uh, so huge problems in the schools. We only get 32,000 uh, physics um, A-levels per annum and out of that we only get 30,000 engineers. We need 100,000 engineers. And we've also got very big problems in the country in terms of gender balance. And uh, this is incredibly serious. We actually are the worst in Europe in that. The other thing which is interesting too in all this is public debt. Uh, Britain's uh, position is as bad as Japan. We're about five t our debt is about five times gross domestic product. Not as bad as China, of course, which is the worst in the world and is defaulting, and of course, the, or the Irish. Um, but it's very interesting. We need manufacturing for export, and to, uh, in order to export, we need manufacturing, we need the engineers. Um, and it's very interesting, if you look at the figures, Britain's only got 11%, Britain's manufacturing is only 11% of gross domestic product. Um, one of our sponsors is Rolex, the watchmaker in Switzerland, and we were having lunch with the board the other day, and I said to them, <clears throat> what, percentage of of, what percentage is manufacturing gross domestic product in Switzerland? And they, they didn't know, but we quickly found out 24%. So Britain is following a long, long way back. So we need a large supply of scientists and engineers, otherwise we'll never get that debt paid off. And one last word on that debt, basically the cost of servicing that debt, and I was paying all the interest and everything else, is now bigger than our entire defence budget. So it gives you an idea to think about that. So we need engineers, big, big time. And to do this, we need an inspiration. And so we set about using the car as the inspiration. It's got very big indeed now. It's very tough because it's growing very fast. We've got uh, uh, 5,500 UK schools on it, 450 schools in South Africa, and God knows how many schools around the world. It's beginning to get very big because the secret of the thing, is, which is what the teachers told us, is we want the data. So we've set this thing up so they can actually have the data. They're going to get in the schools the same data as our engineers get each time that car runs. And it'll run about 30 times in 2015 and about 30 times in 2016. It's been a huge program and now it's being followed in 220 countries. In South Africa, um, together with our friends at the Northern Cape government, uh, we have cleared an entire desert. Uh, we've been cleared a desert, desert to give us our runway, 12 miles of runway. We've had 310 people working for two years, and they've picked up by hand 6,000 tonnes of stones. To get the data off the car, 
Uh, we've had to, the data has got to actually leap from the desert to the nearest uh, entry point to the fiber, um, which happens to be a town called Uppington, 150 miles away. And our sponsor there, MTN, have actually put up five 70 meter high radio masts, permanent installations, so we can get the data across. So we really can do it now. We're going to be operational in South Africa in 2015, where we want to get 800 miles an hour. And we are going to then bring the car back, do all the reworks, go back again in 2016 and finish it off. It's going to generate a vast amount of engineers, and we're all going to learn an enormous amount from this. I'd just like to show you the video, which just shows you just what's going on. This is Bloodhound SSC the most extraordinary and complex racing car ever designed. Built in the UK by a team of Formula One and aerospace experts, it aims to inspire kids about science, technology, engineering and maths by reaching 1,000 miles per hour. Bloodhound is a battle with physics, a journey into the unknown. A jet from a typhoon fighter, a rocket hotter than a volcano, huge metal wheels spinning 170 times a second. With the equivalent of 135,000 horsepower, Bloodhound will cover a mile in just 3.6 seconds, faster than a bullet. The car is being built now. In 2015, it'll be on the Hackskeen Pan in South Africa's Northern Cape, where a team of 300 people have moved 6,000 tons of rocks by hand to create a smooth 12-mile race course on a dry lake bed. Driver Andy Green's first target will be a new record of 800 miles per hour. We'll return in 2016 for the push to 1,000. Followed in 220 countries, we're sharing every detail. Ambassadors are visiting schools and children are setting up their own science clubs. Be part of the adventure. Join the 1K Club Get your school involved. Follow the action every day online and on Twitter. Bloodhound is coming. So uh, my term is nearly up, but uh, just bear in mind, this is a people project. Um, we have 70 people working on the program. Uh, we've got 5,000 members of the support, sorry, 6,000 members of the supporters club, 20,000 people have put their names on the tail. Uh, and as I say, it's being followed in 220 countries. On top of that, to service the schools, we put together an army of uh, ambassadors. The, um, we've got 550 of those. We need 1,000. So uh, I hope that, the peop that one or two people watching today might like to join us. But thank you for the opportunity, and I hope you've enjoyed it.